record to the cloud. So without further ado, um, I think we can perhaps uh, forgo the grand introduction of last time um, and just say that we're in for a real treat from Professor Peter Salson, who is Professor Emeritus of Physics from Syracuse University, uh, now of Providence, uh, and one of our new Temple Emmanuel members and a real gift to our community. So I think without further ado, Peter, take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Rabbi, and thank you all for uh, coming this evening. I'm, I'm very, very happy to be back with you all. Um, and my wife, Sarah, and I are indeed really, really happy to be here in Providence and members of the Temple Emmanuel community. So let me see if I can successfully share my screen. Okay, yes, there we go. And some thumbs up if you see uh, a PowerPoint title slide. Okay, great. All right, so this is indeed part two of a three-part lecture series uh, given it the title, A New Bridge Between Science and Judaism. This one is about time. Last week was about wonder. I'll do a tiny bit more review in just a moment. But let me just step back and give you the overall perspective for, for what I'm doing. Uh, this is the fruit, these lectures are the fruit of my attempt to reconcile two identities that I've had either all my life in the case of being Jewish or being a scientist, which I aspired to be and then became for, for most of my life. And for many of us in that situation, it's a struggle to integrate those two ways of thinking about the world. And I finally got some help when I started reading uh, the books of Abraham Joshua Heschel and struggling to figure out what Heschel was telling me and how Heschel was helping me to integrate those two uh, ways of thinking about the world. That's what's led to what I'm sharing with you all uh, in, in these lectures. In case you missed last week's lecture, in case it isn't 100% present in your mind, let me remind you or uh, give you the capsule summary of what les lessons I hoped people would get from last week's lecture. Uh, the topic was wonder, and wonder is important uh, as a gateway both into scientific discovery and religious thought, and we looked at the words of both scientists and religious thinkers, especially Heschel in the latter case, um, making, making that case. Uh, and there was actually, to me, a sort of a surprising degree of agreement between people who start from wonder and see how it helps them think about the world, whether uh, they are folks like Heschel, who's very explicitly religious and trying to bring us back to religion, uh, Judaism in particular, or physicists like Feynman or Einstein, for whom that was not their project. So that was lesson number one. Lesson number two was my claim that may have been not as universally successful as my first claim, but my claim that um, we can look at existence and rank things on a scale. Hans Jonas called it the ascending scale this idea of what's higher and what's lower turns out to be, uh, in my opinion, a really important concept to use when trying to think about what's important about existence. And the, the, the final lesson that I hoped you would hear me make, whether you took it away firmly convinced or not, is that things that we uh, recognize as highest are also the things most evocative of wonder. So keep those thoughts in mind. They will come in handy somewhat tonight and more in the third lecture. And to give you a preview of what we'll be doing for the next 50 minutes or so, here is uh, the outline of tonight's lecture. I'll be talking about time from several points of view. I'll be talking about time from the point of view that is called flowing time. And that's the aspect of time that we need to understand how time actually is experienced by human beings. 
And then what may be uh, something of a surprise to some of you, but those of you who've uh, had some physics will be less surprised. There is an entirely different face to time uh, that I'll refer to by the term frozen time. And time as it is described by physics works pretty differently than time as we experience it as human beings. And this is a problem. So let me warn you right now that the dramatic arc of tonight's topic is rather different from the dramatic arc of last week. Last week was wonder is our feeling of amazement and this aspect of the world is amazing and this fact of the world evokes wonder and this fact of the world evokes wonder. And I made a claim about which things should be most wonder evoking, but it was kind of a kumbaya thing. Every different aspect of looking at the world was giving us a very similar message. Tonight's dramatic arc is time has this aspect, time has this aspect. They seem irreconcilable. And at one point you will see me display a slide saying the study of time has reached an impasse. So rather than uh, a story of harmony, this is a story tonight of conflict and how we deal with, with that conflict. Um, so the final part of the lecture will be uh, my turning to Abraham Joshua Heschel and showing how he finds a really profound way forward out of that conflict between different ways of looking at time and finds exactly in that conflict a, a resource for religious meaning and for finding uh, Jewish belief. So that's the overview. And now I'd like to turn to one of my favorite poets, Nobel laureate, Bob Dylan, who uh, as well as anyone describes an aspect of time that is all too familiar. If you remember his great song, You're a Big Girl Now, you may remember the lines, time is a jet plane, move so fast. Oh, what a shame if all we've shared can't last. A familiar thought. Dylan wrote it better than most, but pretty familiar. Now, here is another great poet who would have been a Nobel laureate if they had those things back then. This is Shakespeare writing, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. So time is this arrival of one thing after another. And here's another great poet, James Joyce, writing these beautiful lines. Young life is breathed on the glass. The world that was not comes to pass. This is Joyce uh, looking at a, at a baby boy and seeing, uh, seeing the future in uh, the arrival uh, of, of that baby boy. So time is something that moves. Time is the order of succession. Time represents the coming to pass of things that haven't uh, come to pass before. This is uh, uh, some poetic entree into the version of time, the face of time that I'm referring to as flowing time. Um, here's a picture of someone maybe a little less familiar than Dylan or Shakespeare or, or even Joyce, Henri Bergson. Uh, today, he's not so familiar, but in his prime, the first few decades of the 20th century, he was one of the great thinkers who defined the uh, defined Western culture of those decades. And he deserves more attention than, than he gets today. It's really a shame that he's been eclipsed to some degree. Um, but let's step into Bergson's uh, uh, view of the world at the very center of uh, the philosophical project that he devoted his career to was the concept of time's flow. And I've got a few nice sentences of his. Here is one where he asserts uh, how important time as a flowing experience is. He wrote, there's one reality at least 
which we all seize from within by intuition and not by simple analysis. It is our own personality in its flowing through time, our self, which endures. And here in a moment, I'll read this, this next uh, couple of sentences. But before I do, I want to point out that one measure of, of Bergson's important to, importance to early 20th century culture is that he won a Nobel Prize in the late 20s in literature. His writing uh, describing his philosophical thought was considered so evocative that, uh, that he was honored in that way. So here he is trying to e evoke for you uh, in his own literary style, what it feels like to experience the passage of time. He wrote, this inner life may be compared to the unrolling of a coil, for there is no living being who does not feel himself coming gradually to the end of his role, and to live is to grow old. But it may just as well be compared to a continual rolling up, like that of a thread on a ball for our past follows us. It swells incessantly with the present that it picks up on its way and consciousness means memory. Unrolling and rolling. And if you like this sort of thing, you can pick up an introduction to metaphysics. It's a very thin book, but it's mostly a string of metaphors. Uh, Bergson trying to convince you that this is a key fact of existence that each of us uh, understands by virtue of the intuition that connects us with the world. But it's not just artists and it's not just philosophers. Here's a hero from uh, my disciplinary world, Isaac Newton, the founder of physics. And here is his description of time from his main textbook of physics, the Principia Mathematica, where he wrote, absolute true and mathematical time of itself and from its own nature flows equably without regard to anything external and by another name is called duration. So Newton, every bit as much as the poets or the philosopher Bergson um, wanted us to understand time as something that flowed. And it was important to Newton that it flowed equably at an even pace without being affected by anything external. So that all being the case, maybe it would come as a surprise that contemporary physicists have stepped outside that consensus almost entirely. And here is a good source for what is the consensus of modern physics. And that's the great physicist and physics popularizer, Professor Brian Greene. And here's what he had to say as the introductory lines of an hour long episode on time from his PBS series, The Fabric of the Cosmos. He said then, time seems to flow endlessly from one moment to the next. And the flow of time seems to be always in one direction toward the future. But that may not be right. Discoveries over the last century have shown that much of what we think about time may be nothing more than an illusion. Contrary to everyday experience, time may not flow at all. Our past may not be gone. Our future may already exist. Now, I underlined on this slide what I think is the punchline of what he's trying to say, but I wonder if anyone picked up the oddity of Brian Greene's literary style. I've now shown in bold how many uses of the word may he used. In fact, I see that I missed one. So Greene is hedging his bets, which is either means he's using weasel words, or a much nicer way of saying it is that this is actually a problem. And he's admitting, even while he's devoting an hour to explaining the standard current physics view of time and how it works, that 
hidden within that new understanding of time from physics is actually a, a puzzle that is completely unre unresolved. So let's, let me highlight the various versions of this puzzle. One version is, does time flow, as the poets and Bergson said, or is that an illusion, as Brian Greene said? Related to that, and I'll explain this much uh, uh, explicitly in a little while, is um, an, a, a question from within physics, and that is, are space and time separate, or is it better to think of them together as a single entity going under the name of space-time? I'll have more to say about that in a little bit. And here's the most philosophical version of the question, and that is, is the present moment all that exists? Or may, might it be the case that the past and the future exist every bit as much? And I wanna focus uh, on that last question, and, and you'll see uh, these cartoon diagrams that I've got here for several different philosophical pictures of the nature of reality. Um, we've got the question of whether the present moment is all that exists, or maybe everything is together. And I don't expect everyone to recognize why these cartoons represent those ideas yet, but I'll be taking some time and uh, by 10 or 15 minutes from now, everyone should be able to understand why those particular sketches represent uh, these various ideas of what is the nature of existence. But realize that we are confronting this uh, already in, with some knowledge that there's this conflict between the apparent lesson of 20th and 21st century physics versus the seeming unanimity of every human being who thinks about the nature of time. So I wanna move into the explicitly physics lecture part of, uh, of tonight's lecture. And to do that, can't give a physics lecture without a demonstration, so I'm going to stop the screen share for a moment and do a physics demo. Everyone ready? Physicists always do demos with a ball. Amazing, huh? Let me do it again in case you didn't see it. Okay, the flight of a ball is, in fact, in my many years of teaching physics, I did that demo countless times. There we go. Let's go back to this will work. Okay, so everyone saw the ball. Yeah, good. Um, now, you saw it in live action via the, the miracle of Zoom video. But now let's try to take apart that motion and see how we can represent it graphically. So in a moment, we'll look at this graph, but first, let's, could I ask you to give your attention to the words that I'm gonna to use to describe what you saw in that demo. When the ball left my hand, it was flying upward, but as soon as it left my hand, it started slowing, got slower, slower, eventually stopped at the highest point of motion, and then started to fall down with increasing speed. If you ever took any physics course, you saw that demo and you thought through these words, and you probably drew a graph very much like this. Let me explain the graph, and then I'll step back and say why it's such an important graph to understand. So, on this graph, I've displayed on the horizontal axis how high the ball was. I shouldn't have said the ground. I should have said my hand when I let it go. The height of the ball. And on the vertical axis, I'm displaying time. Some of you may have drawn this graph tipped the other way with time as the horizontal axis 
but when people are thinking about the nature of time, and especially in the, in the context of the theory of relativity that we'll be talking about, we always in that context make time uh, be on the vertical axis and a spatial dimension be on the horizontal axis. So this curve represents point by point along the curve how high the ball was at successive moments of time. So here it is leaving my hand and then getting higher, higher, higher till it reaches its maximum height and then falls down. And if you're good at reading graphs like this, you might notice that the steepness of this curve here says that uh, the ball was moving fastest and now it's getting shallower if I think of it in the normal way and then speeding up, speeding up here. So we could just call this graph the graph of height of the ball versus time. That's a very good description of it. Another much more fancy sounding name that I want to use for the rest of our time together tonight is to call this a space-time diagram. It's okay for me to call it that because it's a graph with a spatial dimension and a time dimension. Um, it's a very boring space-time diagram, not only because my demo of a ball leaving my hand and falling back down is not the most exciting demo ever, even though it might be the most important one I've ever done, but also we're only showing one spatial dimension in this version of a space-time diagram, just the height of the ball. Now I want to show you a more interesting space-time diagram that we need to draw if we want to look at a more interesting kind of motion. Say, for example, I wanted a space-time diagram to represent the motion of the Earth around the sun. I might start by saying, well, I don't know how to draw the space-time diagram yet, but I do know how to make snapshots of where the Earth is in its orbit around the sun at various times. For example, here is a snapshot of looking down on the solar system from above the ecliptic plane. And this asterisk in the center represents where the sun is, and this dot represents where the Earth is, and we've got a prediction that the Earth is gonna be moving around here, drawn in this circular orbit. Here's another snapshot three months later, April. The Earth is a quarter of the way around. Can everyone guess where the Earth will be in July? It'll be halfway around from January, October, three quarters of the way around. And you can probably guess that the next January frame will look something like this. Okay, this is not a space-time diagram yet. This is a set of frames out of a movie, if you'd like, or just sketches from four different times. Now, we can approach a space-time diagram by taking those four frames from the movie of four sketches and stacking them stacking them in a vertical direction according to the time at which they occurred. So here's the January one, three months up April, three months up July, three months up more October, and presumably the Earth keeps going around. There's another January one up there. We're almost there. Now let's label our axes as we've got time as the vertical axis. And in this magic of perspective drawing on a flat computer screen, we've got two spatial dimensions represented horizontally. And now we imagine that something that we know to be true, that even though we only had four snapshots of where the Earth was in, the, in its orbit around the sun, that it actually at a January 1st position and a January 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th. So there actually were stacks of, of pictures that I didn't draw. And we can actually, if we want, know where the Earth was at each moment of time and connect all those dots and the path that the Earth has taken through space and through time is a curve that we call, in this case, the Earth's world line. 
And world lines are a feature of space-time diagrams. They're a curve that shows a path through space as a function of time. And the Earth's world line is a helix. Okay, so now this is kind of an interesting space-time diagram. And this notion that we can represent a chunk of space through an interval of time as some kind of three-dimensional, sometimes we call it two plus one dimensions, but it ends up being three, uh, is, is, a, is a nice way of representing space and time together. Do we want to do that or not is a separate question, but this is something that uh, physicists have learned to do, and I'm going to make the case in a moment why it's so valuable. So one more thing about how to interpret a space-time diagram is that any horizontal plane in a space-time diagram represents a moment of time, it represents all of space, or at least the two dimensions of space that we've been able to fit on the graph that all are occurring at the space at the same time. So uh, now you can understand that first of the three cartoons, the one labeled the present, um, is representing a particular moment of time by a particular horizontal slice taken out of a space-time diagram. And especially if you are among the people who think that the present is what is real, then you might be interested to have a synonym for the present, namely everything in the universe at a given moment of time. So that's what this cartoon represents. It's a separate question whether that's the right answer to the philosophical question, but strictly speaking, just as the way we would represent the idea, the present moment or any other moment of time is given by a horizontal slice out of a space-time diagram. So now let's rephrase everything I said explicitly in uh, this philosophical language. What is real? And there's this hypothesis out there that we will treat as a with a question mark right now. Does reality consist of everything in the universe that exists right now? Or alternatively, are the past, present, and future all equally real? And now let me make clear, as I, as I hope maybe you are guessing, why this cartoon represents the idea that the past, present, and future are all equally real. This box is a chunk out of a space-time diagram, and the two horizontal dimensions represent two of the three dimensions of space. The vertical one, vertical dimension, represents time. And now here, drawn first in a solid, uh, solid marks and then with dots, is a world line of some object. I don't know what it is. Something doing something more interesting than the Earth going around the sun. But in sketching, multiple dimensions of space and a chunk of time. This cartoon is representing, standing in as a reminder for the idea that maybe we'll end up thinking that it makes the most sense to say, no, reality consists of more than now. Reality consists of the past, present, and future all on an equal basis. Again, this is a cartoon. It's not an argument yet for which answer we should take to be true. Now I want to assert something, and this is where Brian Greene got his uh, warrant for saying it may be the case that uh, uh, the feeling of the flow of time is an illusion. I'm representing this idea with a photograph of one of the great developers of the theory of relativity from the early part of the 20th century. His name was Hermann Weyl. And I'm going to quote perhaps the single most quoted sentence about relativity. 
And it isn't a sentence by Einstein, it's by Hermann Weyl. And what Weyl wrote was, the objective world simply is, it does not happen. And I want us to think what that perhaps overly simple sentence could mean and why it would be the case that one of the main developers of the theory of relativity would write it and why it would be so widely quoted. So before I try to convince you that this might be true, let me just try to make sure what, what the stake is. So on this slide, I've got another version of the cartoon view of two dimensions of space, one of time, with some world lines drawn through it. But now the stakes are maybe a bit clearer because these world lines you can see are labeled, they begin and they, and they end, and the beginning of this one is labeled birth. The end of this one is labeled death. These are the world lines representing where one individual was, another individual, or another human being throughout their entire lives. And what Weil seems to be saying when he says the objective world simply is, it does not happen, is that we ought to actually picture that our entire life is there not one particular moment, perhaps marked by that particular dot, but this statement that I'm gonna to try to justify a bit by talking a bit more about the content of the theory of relativity is that we don't have a preferred moment at which we are existing. Our entire existence counts every bit as much. Or in other words, we aren't simply here at the present moment, whatever the present moment means, and what Weil is actually doing is questioning the existence of a present moment. But instead, he's claiming all of the moments of each of our lives, world lines, are all equally real. But you're entitled to ask, can that be so? Why would someone insist that physics teaches that that's so? Now, if I were really going to convince you by the standards I would normally use as a physics professor, we'd have to be here for two or three hours and not one that's already half elapsed. So I'm just going to try to state in as clear a way as I can what the argument is and not convince you that it's true uh, for purposes of having this discussion about uh, science and, and Judaism together. So here uh, with picture of one of my great heroes and almost everyone's favorite physics hero, Einstein, I'm going to make the claim that most physicists almost all the time, at least when they're being physicists, agree with that sentence of Viles. And the reason is that contained in the theory of relativity, is a problem for the common sense view that now is something important and that now ticks by to a later and later now as we wait. The problem is that relativity demonstrates that there's no good way to clearly and unambiguously define what now means. Different observers are guaranteed to disagree about which set of happenings in the world are simultaneous with one another. And no observer is better than any other one. And as a result, since there's no way of saying which one is right and different observers disagree about which events come together in any particular moment, it's really difficult to picture a world existing only as a now. And now I just want to illustrate, uh, again, not being able to prove it unless we were going to take much more time than any of you all have patience for tonight. Let me just um, 
illustrate what kind of argument Einstein first developed and then Weil summarized in that very famous sentence about the world is, it doesn't happen. So here is a space-time diagram in this nice cartoon that I was able to borrow from Wikipedia. And there is one dimension of space graphed left to right, one dimension of time graphed vertically, but you can actually see in different moments in this animation, something funny is happening. We'll get back to what that funniness is in just a moment. But before we do, let me draw your attention to these three spots labeled A, B, and C. They represent three events. For example, uh, the blink of a light on and off at one particular moment at location A, one particular moment, location B, one particular moment at location C. Now, to an observer who is at rest with respect to those three objects, A, B, and C, that did that flashing, those three events were arranged to look simultaneous to that observer. And their simultaneity comes from the fact that they all lie on a horizontal line as drawn when those green things are all drawn nice and rectilinear. That, we'll come back in a moment, you'll see that's the moment when down at the bottom it says V equals zero. But now an observer that's moving to the right at a high speed, say in this case, three tenths of the speed of light, that observer sees event C first, B second, and A latest. Same events, just how the universe appears to a different observer who's moving with respect to those three events. And it's worse than that because an observer moving to the left sees A first, B second, and C latest. And that's represented by the fact that whenever it says V equals zero, the lines of constant time are drawn horizontally in the graph. But when we're talking about how it's seen by the observer moving to the right, those green lines slope upwards. And then when we're talking about the observer moving to the left, those lines of constant time slope upwards to the left. Now, if anyone says, that's a nice animation, but you didn't prove anything to me, you're correct. I only want to state how complicated the world looks when you know something about the theory of relativity. What it tells you is that the idea that multiple events are simultaneous with one another is an observer-dependent statement. It's not something that's absolutely true or absolutely false. Space and time aren't separable. Motion through space affects how you see the temporal order of events. And that means, first of all, that I can now assert why physicists who learn the theory of relativity want to talk about space-time and not space or time because they get mixed up in this really interesting way. And we have to talk about them as one interesting, complicated unit. Um, but it also should be now causing you to wonder whether this cartoon of the nature of reality could possibly be correct. Because when I drew this cartoon, I said, a moment of time, call it the present, is represented by a horizontal slice through space time. But different observers will make that slice at different angles. There is no one right answer representing horizontal slice through space-time. The lesson of this animation is that some observer 
would see all of the events on this plane of space and time being simultaneous, but another observer would say, no, you did it wrong. Actually, this set of events are the ones that are simultaneous. And if that's the case, then we've got a real problem. If we were attracted by the view that the nature of reality is everything that exists now. Because my everything that exists now is not what everyone else would agree with. So we don't have a now that even makes sense. Now is not a well-defined concept. And for that reason, it seems that the only thing that everyone, no matter what their state of motion is, could agree on is that, well, world lines happen, but there's no way of saying whether this moment here is happening at the same time as that, or whether this moment here is simultaneous with something that, something there on this world line. And as a result, relativists end up saying it's only the whole set of all of space through all of time that we can think of in any logical way. We can't pick out any slices in a space-time diagram. And if that's the case, if there's no correct way to pick out any moment and recognize it as the present moment, maybe all moments of time are equally real. Hence, Hermann Weyl's statement, the objective world simply is, it does not happen, it does not tick by. And Einstein wrote an especially poignant description of this point of view very late in his life, a few months before his own death, his best friend Michele Besso passed away and Einstein wrote a letter of consolation to his best friend's parents. And the best way he could think of to console them in their grief was this statement. Now, Michele has departed from this strange world a little ahead of me. That means nothing. People like us who believe in physics know that the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. And you can see that illusion word that uh, Brian Greene picked up later on. So Einstein is telling Besso's parents, think of it this way, and look, it's, it's sad, but this, this is life. So I want to pause for a moment. I'll stop my screen share for one more and just ask, have I convinced you that time doesn't pass? And this is like an honest question. I see, I see a hand or two going up who've, to whom I've made a sale. It's okay to be honest, okay? It's 100% honest. Okay, I'm seeing several hands up and I'm seeing a thumbs down. Good, thank you for your honesty and, and courage. All right, so thank you for that vote. And recall that we'll have time for questions at the end. So I was glad to see that I'd made the sale to some of you and I was glad to see at least one person willing to say, come on. Um, so now here's the big reveal. Not even Vile was convinced by this. Right? That famous quote that physicists use over and over, the objective world simply is, it does not happen, is a quote taken out of context. Here is a fuller quote. The objective world simply is, it does not happen only to the gaze of my consciousness, crawling along the world line of my body, does a section of this world come to life as a fleeting image in space, which continuously changes in time. 
when I discovered that this is what Weil actually said instead of what my physics teachers had quoted out of context, I said, wow, that is just amazing. So what Weil seems to be saying is in spite of what relativity appears to be teaching us, somehow or other, this naive but perhaps profoundly true human picture that time is flowing, elapsing, we are moving through time from one present moment to another, somehow seems to be a correct description, if not from fundamental physics, then at least in terms of human experience. And here is the thing that blew me away even more, was that Einstein actually seemed to agree with Weil too, at least some of the time. I have no reason to think that he was insincere when he wrote that letter to Michele Besso's parents, but here he is in conversation with the philosopher Rudolf Carnap as uh, recounted later by Carnap. And Carnap wrote later on, once Einstein said that the problem of the now worried him seriously. He explained that the experience of the now means something special for man something essentially different from the past and the future, but that this important difference does not and cannot occur within physics. That this experience cannot be described in science seemed to him a matter of painful but inevitable resignation. Einstein thought that these scientific descriptions cannot possibly satisfy our human needs, that there is something essential about the now which is just outside the realm of science. You heard it here, folks, the most famous scientist in the world saying, you know, science just doesn't seem to capture everything. Now, I will tell you this as a former student of physics and then professor of physics, we got the Michele Besso consolation letter as part of our education, but not this. Take that for what it can mean. So, time is simply an enigma. Study of time is at the moment at least an impasse. All of human experience tells us that we exist in a present moment or a now that somehow or other moves or flows through time. While physics has never been contradicted, seems to be telling us that all moments throughout history are equally real without any notion of the now or of the flow of time. So given that seemingly crucial description of how existence works is at an impasse. How can we form any kind of unified view? Here I want to turn to my philosopher, theologian, hero, Abraham Joshua Heschel. And in particular, I'm going to share with you a few quotes from his three main popular books, The Sabbath from 1951, Man is Not Alone, 1951 as well, and God in Search of Man, 1955. And if you're sensitized to the problem, you realize that as much as anything else, Heschel is developing a theology of time. And he can be read, and I think correctly, as showing how you must hold these divergent views of time in your head at the same time and find that conflict not, um, uh, not a problem, but a resource for religious understanding. So here is uh, Heschel on time. I have four or five sentences I want to share with you all. So Heschel is down on space and he loves time. Here's a way to see that. The boundless, continuous, but vacuous entity, which realistically is called space, is not the ultimate form of reality. Our world is a world of space moving through time from the beginning to the end of days. Seems like he's firmly in the time's flow camp, the Bergson camp, but not so fast. Here's Heschel complicating that view. Time is like an eternal burning bush. So each instant must vanish to open the way to the next one, time itself is not consumed. Time has independent, ultimate significance. It is of more majesty 
and more provocative of awe, wonder, than even a sky studded with stars. It goes on. Time is both near and far, intrinsic to all experience and transcending all experience. It belongs exclusively to God. Time then is otherness, a mystery that hovers above all categories. It is as if time and the mind were a world apart. Yet, it is only within time that there is fellowship and togetherness of all beings. Otherness and togetherness highlighted in Heschel's original. A paradox. <coughs> and perhaps as a, at least a short-term summary of Heschel's view, we can only solve the problem of time through sanctification of time. To man alone, time is elusive. To man with God, time is eternity in disguise. Creation is the language of God. Time is his song. And things of his space, the consonants in the song. Sanctified time is to thing, sing the vowels in unison with him. Maybe Heschel should have gotten a Nobel Prize in literature as well. Um, and it's probably become clear already that Heschel is my hero, but I don't take him as my sole uh, resource for learning what, about Jewish thought. Uh, but he's a great clue. And here's something that these remarks of, of Heschel's um, prepared me to see. Here is a familiar bracha for many of us. This is the traditional prayer that we say upon awakening in the morning. But think about what is being said about God in this statement that we recite when we're not 100% awake. It says God is both living, high, and eternal or enduring, the Kayan. And this description of God with these two seemingly, once you are sensitized to it, opposing attributes linked together, you see it all through our liturgy. It's not just modernity, Melech Kai the Kayan. In fact, once, once I noticed this and was obsessing about it, I had another experience that I'll share with you very briefly. Um, uh, in our synagogue in Syracuse, one Shabbat, we invited the imam of the Syracuse mosque to come and he gave a really nice presentation. And one of the things that he wanted to share with us um, was how the names of God in Islam were amazing theological resources, but that they were also linked to our uh, Jewish descriptions of God. And in particular, he recited one of the names of Allah, and it sounded, I could hear it. He was speaking Arabic, but I could hear because he said Allah was Chayva Kayam. So this is not just a, a, a one-off in one prayer. This is uh, one of monotheism's most profound insights about the nature of God. God is both participating in the flow of time and enduring or eternal outside of time. So here is Heschel's uh, perhaps best summary statement about how to use the conf apparently conflicting views of time to reach a unified understanding of existence. And what Heschel wrote was, eternity is not perpetual future, but perpetual presence. This is the meaning of existence, to reconcile, reconcile liberty with service, to weave the threads of temporality into the fabric of eternity. So to sum up, we need frozen time. 
if we're going to understand physics. But we need flowing time if we're going to understand how existence feels to conscious beings like ourselves. And if you have noticed, whenever I was giving an example of where a space-time diagram made sense and was helpful, it was for the lower aspects of existence, the mechanical things that physics is so good at describing. Higher things like human experience of existence needs flowing time. And Heschel, in his inimitable way, was able to show that Jewish, li uh, Jewish living uh, does best by um, linking temporal existence to the eternal in a way that, that redeems both of them. So what I've left you with as, and this will be a teaser for lecture number three, is that we've got this apparently irreconcilable problem, except in Heschel's religious synthesis, that we have to carry forward both frozen time from physics and flowing time from human experience. And that tells me that at least the current state of our understanding of the natural world through the mechanism of science has an essential incompleteness. And I'll be using that conflict and that incompleteness as a starting point for the argument that I'll present next week. Same time, same Zoom channel, and the topic will be an argument that I haven't seen elsewhere, except in Heschel's writing, for why you ought to believe in God. And it's going to start from, uh, from this problem right here. So that's the end of my prepared material. And what I'd like to do now is stop the screen share. And if you've got a question, please type it in the chat. That'll be the easiest way um, for me to, to see it and, and respond to it. And I can't imagine that there, that there aren't some questions because this is, this is weird stuff. Uh, while you're typing your questions, there were two comments along the way from Larry Smith. In civil engineering, we often model construction sequencing in 4D, forming a time-space continuum. Would you consider that frozen time, flowing time, or flowing frozen time? Yes. I would. <laughs> I'm being fresh, but uh, it, that kind of analytical tool is, of course, an excellent analytical tool, an excellent planning tool. And uh, when it's on the pieces of paper or the computer program, you can think of it as four dimensions all there. But of course, you have to live it out in the actual construction sequence as, as, as you live it. So um, it's, it's both or, or all three. Does that seem fair, Larry? You can unmute yourself and, and comment on that. Yes, it's actually something I've wondered about when I've watched it. We'll do it on complex construction projects so that the contractor doesn't paint himself into a corner. Mm -hmm. I, I always get the feeling when I'm watching, I'm looking at the past, the present, and the future. Yes. Yes, you are. Or think of, think of another example, right? You have a movie on a DVD disc. Perhaps people still remember that, right? Instead of just streaming, right? The whole two hours of the movie, you can hold in your hand and it's all there. Of course, to actually see the movie, you play it and it lives out through time. So, um, thank we, you. Go ahead. Thank you. Sure. Okay. And here is a remark under the name of Rochelle Rosen, but last week it wasn't Rochelle who, uh, who was writing under that name. It says, time is core to our reality on earth, just as Newtonian mechanics is the best way to understand the world. Do you want to unmute and uh, expand on that? Yeah, this is John Landry. I just... Uh, uh, I really appreciated what you said, particularly about Heschel at the end. Uh, it's just hard for me, and I'm a historian, so maybe that's, uh -huh. maybe I'm the toughest crowd there is for this argument, but it's, it was just uh -huh. hard for me to get into the relativity part, because I always understood real relativity as something that applies to 
outer space and very mm -hmm. large bodies. But here on Earth, Newtonian mechanics is basically fine. Yes. Okay. Well, th thank you for framing it in that way because it it uh, it lets me say that for practical purposes, you are one hundred percent correct. But now, ask whether two theories that mostly agree, whether um, that's good enough if you're asking ultimate questions and not just can I make a practical uh, prediction of what's going to happen next, which is what we normally use physics for, but sometimes we step outside, like I'm doing tonight, and say, what does it say about the nature of reality? And even though they agree in almost perfect precision almost all the time, the fact that they disagree some of the time says they're not describing the same universe. And my argument would be that you have to take the best theory, the theory that works all the time, that's precise, and has passed all the tests as your best guide to philosophy. I would normally say that, except even that best theory seems to be in conflict with other kinds of evidence that we haven't, just haven't been able to bring into physics yet. Okay. Thank it's you. Great, yeah, it's a, it's a great kind of question. Okay, and Amy Cohen writes, you pose the question, how can we form a unified view of existence? But I, Amy, can't help but wonder how there could ever be a communal experience of now. Amy, do you want to, do you want to expand on that? Uh, this is overwhelming <laughs> because picturing the slices, even the, the animated view of that with people in different positions, how could there ever be, be here now? A community mm. meditation, when there's an attempt to build community, I'm just taking this way out of the practical, mm -hmm. uh, way out of the, the theoretical into the practical. Into the practical. possible based on what you've taught us tonight, I feel skeptical that there can ever be truly a shared experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. How well, pressing, Peter. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a great question, so it, it gives me the opportunity to say why it mostly works. Okay. Um, you may have noticed that when velocities were being marked on that animated graph, one of those velocities was three-tenths of the speed of light, and the other was five-tenths of the speed of light going the other way in order to make dramatic disagreements between what's happening now, very high speeds have to be involved, which we, in ordinary circumstances, never experience. What's a high speed? You know, you were doing 55 in a 30 mile an hour zone. Do you know what fraction of the speed of light that is? That's like this much. Furthermore, the disagreements that are huge, when they are huge, are huge in assigning a particular time to events that are separated by large amounts of space. Our experience of, our shared experience of the present moment is in better times, people sitting together in a room, or in times like this, dispersed a bit, but we're actually very close to each other. And since our speeds are small, ridiculously small by the standard of the speed of light, and our distances are close, it does, the problem doesn't arise. So this goes back to, to the same issue uh, that we were talking about a moment ago, that for most practical purposes, you can switch back and forth. And we only want to force the issue of having to choose when we need to move away from practical things and ask, but really, what's the real story? So I hope that, hope that was somewhat helpful. Good. All right. Here from Sheldon and Evie Middleman. I do not think frozen and continuum time are a conflict, just like a circle is an infinite number of small arcs, continual time is the same. Do you want to unmute and, and say a bit more about what you meant? Sure. Um, 
I don't think it's a conflict. I think a continual time is, is exactly what it is. It's, a sli it's an infinite number of slices between mm -hmm. the past and the future. And right. just like a circle is an infinite number of, mm -hmm. of tiny arcs that form a circle. And the only conflict I have in this whole thing is the word exact. People talk about exact time. And there's, to me, there's almost no such thing. Mm -hmm. Because now, by the time you say the word now, it's what just happened. Right. Okay. Under most circumstances, I, I think you would be 100% correct. But here's, here's what I think the issue is at stake that I was trying to put forward. There is this flowing time view, surely, as flowing time elapsed, if that's the correct view, okay, ends up describing all of the different moments of time in the space-time diagram, just, just as you said. And yet, it's, it's as if someone was saying, I never have the whole circle. I just have this one arc, and then I have another arc, and then I have another arc. So it's really not a question of the geometrical agreement, the geometric ability to analyze a circle into a set of small arcs, it's a, it's a question outside of mathematics or outside of physics. Does only one arc exist at any given moment or is, is the circle there and unbroken? Yeah, I think the, the word continuum is maybe not the right word because mm -hmm. I think time flows, if I can use that word, in an infinite number of steps, tiny steps. Mm -hmm. Just like electricity doesn't flow continually, it actually yeah. electrons hop from one step one one mm -hmm. step to another. So yeah. I, I again I think it's I, I just don't see the conflict. Okay, all right. Um, I think there is a conflict philosophically, but not at the level of of analysis. I think yep, that's fine. Where you put your head. Okay, thank 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 you for that, Sheldon. Okay, here is a question from Katya. I do have a question about the potential conflict about reality, however accurate, and the limits of our lived experience, however limited and inaccurate. Katya, do you want to unmute and say more? Okay, so I'm going to try this metaphorically, and I'm sorry if this is like childhood knowledge, because that's all I have. Science is not my forte, but let's consider the mole. You know, wonderful, wonderful creature that does not see. The mole cannot know a rainbow. Now, one may argue that from all that our human experience and, and science, in fact, tells us, as far as refracted light and moisture in the air, etc., go, rainbows do exist, but the sight of a rainbow can never bring joy to the mole, no matter what. And so, in my own day to day, which today for me is not a great day. The fact is, you know, my grandmother died a few years ago. As much as she is in my heart, she is still dead. I will not see her. I cannot touch her. I cannot tell her that I'm sorry I wasn't better and how much I loved and admired her. And, and that chance is gone. I, no instrument exists to curve a little bit around to just a little beyond the corner so I can see that maybe in a couple of years this pandemic will be over and my beloved husband who's my entire universe will still be here and so nothing is gonna stop my terror because tomorrow I have to walk into a classroom as much as all of those moments may exist I understand that in some scientific sense my grandmother still exists and maybe this is over and maybe we are here and maybe life and death are more nebulous. But it, true knowledge of that lies beyond the door that all of us only pass once and can't report back from. So on some level, I can't, I, I know it sounds gloomy and I know it's difficult to explain, but I can't quite reconcile it. Like for me, it is only this moment, whether good or bad, like, I can't just wish it to be, oh, well, it's 2012 and Barack Obama's president and I can go to school open-faced and not be afraid. 
it's just my reality must be this moment and sometimes the moment stinks. Okay, so thank you, Katya. And again, this week, like last week, um, it, what you prefaced by saying this might be babyish was actually uh, beautiful and very insightful. And I'm appreciative of your remarks coming just after Sheldon's because between the two of you, you described the two seemingly conflicting views of time. And so we had both of them presented in, in, in very personal and moving ways, uh, one after another. And it, to me, underlines the fact that even someone like Hermann Weyl or an even more famous and greater physicist, Albert Einstein, they were stuck, which was the better way to think about reality, not because Sheldon is right and Katya is wrong, or because Katya is right and Sheldon is wrong, but because both points of view seem to be equally right and equally wrong at the same time. So that was beautiful, beautiful summary of the point. So thank you both for that. Now, Eve writes, question, this makes me feel confused about the meaning of the word real or reality. When I hear the question, is time real? I wonder, what do you mean by the word real? Eve, I don't know what I mean by the word real. Um, do you want to maybe help, help me out? You can unmute. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, well, just again, I mean, whenever I hear people talk about real reality, it's like it is the one word that's never defined. And, uh, you know, the, my first question is well, wait a minute, maybe I don't understand what you mean by real. Okay. I mean, kind of like Kat just said, my reality is this moment. I don't even know if it's a shared reality. I mean, you know, now may not be something we can, you know, be this, you know, kind of consensual. Like, well, this is now, but I don't even know if what, you know, is is my reality is is, you know, the same to everybody else. So I just it's like, is time real? I mean, what does that word mean, real? Well, to, all right. To a physicist, I can tell you. Real, okay. Okay. A concept that is useful in describing and understanding the universe. So by that definition of reality, time is definitely real. Now, which form of time is real or which form of a description of the universe is real? I feel, I feel like the description of Katya and Sheldon or the description of the two successive sentences by Weil just throws the question back to you and says, yes, that's a great question. Eve, you asked a great question. What's the definition of a great question? A great question is one that doesn't have a simple, straightforward answer. And I don't mean that flippantly, okay? I mean that in a profound sense. Okay, so some more questions. Here's from Saul Martin who writes, is the problem of time just a problem of the observer? If there was nobody observing, time would not flow. Uh, Saul, do you want to unmute and, and expand? Well, yeah, most of, you know, in your description there um, of the lights, the three lights seen differently. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, presumably, the lights are actually uh, there in the same place. It's only the perceptual limitations we have that make it difficult for us to see that. So um, it means that, um, uh, uh, we, we, you know, we can't see everything. So uh, we, we don't know, we can't really know what's going on. Yes, okay, beautifully said. And I agree with everything that you said, except the word only, as in it's only. Um, yeah perception. It's precisely a matter of perception and perceiving subjects. If there weren't perceiving subjects like ourselves, yes, the problem wouldn't occur. Guess what? We're here and we have a problem. Um, so yes, I think you put your, put your finger on it. Thank, thank you for that. All right. Here is a question from Mark or an observation. Mark says, I have an observation being that I teach an art based in Taoist philosophy and the now, 
and would like to know your thoughts. Mark, unmute and share, please. Okay, before I hit that, I just want to mention I'm totally fascinated by the concept of time, and I'm totally open to the fact of time existing on the same plane. Uh, and I don't, also don't think that means that fate is engraved in stone, because from what I've read, if for some reason something changes on a timeline, you split over and now you go into a parallel dimension. So there are all these possible openings, which I just find incredibly fascinating. Again, like I said last week about not knowing the nature of God, I don't know if any of this is true, but nonetheless, fascinating, and I can see it. Now, the now. In Taoist philosophy, and when you really go really deep, now is a loaded term, okay? I teach a martial art for 40 years now. I've been doing a martial art that's based in Taoist philosophy. So let's talk about the initial now as martial art. When I tell my students, you don't move till it gets here. You don't move till it gets here because it may never get here. And you may not ever have to move. And then when, when it does get here, that energy is now expended. It's done. And now you can redirect and do something and they cannot recover from it. Mm -hmm. And I tell my students, that's life. If you worry about things that are gonna happen, they might not happen, and you've worried yourself for nothing. And if they do happen, you're gonna to be too stressed out and not be able to deal with it. And the best thing is to be in the moment and be aware of your surroundings and your options. And when you need to make that move, you make that move, which my wife, who I love more than anything, has not adopted that yet. Not okay? adopted. Because she says she's living in the now, but yet she is not. She is living in the what might happen. This will be hap horrible. At the moment, we are in our house and there is nothing wrong and we are not sick and everything is fine, but you're worrying about what will happen. When we get into deep, deep Taoist meditation, standing meditation stuff where you're moving your energy and you're in the now, you are connected to everything. Everything. You want to say... If, Timeline, past, present, future, everything, you're just connected. You are just empty and connected. So it doesn't have that thing. I'm in the now. Just got my students say, you say live in the now and you're upset. I go, yeah, I'm upset now. And then I won't be. You know, live in the moment. But the moment is defined by each individual person and on where you are. It's not a thing. Okay. So what, what's your opinion on that? What's my opinion? Uh, my personal opinion is that all of these different points of view about time have some profound truth to them. And let me define profound truth. And I will quote another famous physicist that I haven't had a chance to quote yet in these lectures, Niels Bohr, one of the inventors of oh, yeah. the early de decades of the 20th century. Yeah. And Bohr's love to say profound things. And here is maybe his most profound thing. He said, a trivial truth is a truth whose opposite is false. A profound truth is a truth whose opposite is also true. And I think we're, that's what we're dealing with, dealing with here. So thank you for that, Mark. That was really quite beautiful. So Rabbi Zarin wrote, the idea that God exists in all of time simultaneously feels very grounded in Judaism to me. In addition to a moda ami, I'm thinking also of the first line of Yigdam. The idea that I'm trying to wrap my head around is where we humans fit in. Do we also exist in all of time at once, or is that inherently a godly way of being that we might strive for through sanctification of time, as Heschel points out, but cannot ever quite attain? That's beautifully written. Is there anything you want to add uh, with your voice, for Rabbi? Um, I, I'm not sure there's much more to add except to say that I'm no physicist, right? I'm not approaching this from the scientific perspective, though I, I'm trying to wrap my head around everything that you've shared. Um, and, and to reiterate that it, it feels, it's not just Moda Ani and Yigdal, and Yigdal of course is based on, on Maimonides' philosophy, which is based on prior sources. Um, and the, the line in Yigdal, for those who are curious, is um, Nimtza v'ein eit el mitziyuto. You've probably sung it a dozen times, but how often do we read the translation, right? Nimtza, God is found, 
the ain eight on the tzuyuto, but there is no time for God's being found, right? God, God exists, but isn't, isn't time, there's no timeliness to God's existence um, and other places as well. And so for me, what, what's stopping me up, aside from trying, aside from trying to comprehend the physics, is that feels like such a godly thing to exist in all of time at once. Um, and almost by definition, not human. And I'm having trouble getting across that hump and trying to accept that possibly we also as human beings exist in all of time at once. And I don't know if you have thoughts or, or reflections or, or I don't necessarily right. expect you to answer the question, but I, I wanted to put it out there because that's where I'm leaving tonight with. Um, what my best response to you is to describe how time feels to me. And in spite of the fact that I am an indoctrinated physicist, time feels to me as if I'm living as best I can, Mark, in the present moment. And that what the present moment means is ticking by. That's how time feels to me. I know how to manipulate the concept of time. The other version that relativity teaches us is correct, except we saw that the founders of relativity didn't even in their hearts believe it was 100% correct. So that's why I think Heschel speaking for the Jewish tradition that, that you've uh, expounded on just now uh, um, very helpfully, that's one way of trying to guide us, A, to hold these two seemingly conflicting points of view, relax about trying to hold them simultaneously, even though they seem to conflict. But of course, what he does is much more than just um, put some ointment on an itch. He's saying, no, in fact, being able to see that both things must actually be true and are truest in God's nature and in the nature of God's uh, relationship with us is a way of turning a problem into a resource. Um, but don't force yourself, I guess, to, to help you with your specific thing, don't force yourself to try to picture your entire life existing in your head. I mean, I don't know how to live that way. I don't know how anyone knows how to live that way. And I don't even think Einstein could, could do it as much as he tried when he was writing that way. Well, thank you all for your interest and patience. I think I've gotten to everything that was, that was sent and we're almost nine o'clock. So I've used up a lot of you all's time and patience this evening. Thank you so much for your attention and your interest. And if you uh, want to be, be here a week from tonight, and we'll see the most profound religious thing that Heschel did with these problems. So thank you again. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. This was uh, wonderful. Gave me a lot to think about. I, I know from the comments, gave everyone a lot to think about. You're an incredible teacher, incredible speaker, incredible thinker. Um, so thank you so much. And yeah, thank uh, you very much. Out We'll be sending out the video for tonight. A couple people messaged me privately. If you aren't able to make next week, we'll be sending out the recording from that as well, assuming all the technology goes smoothly. So we'll make sure you get a chance to hear it. Thank you, everyone. I don't. Thank you. Thank you.